Well, good morning and welcome today to Thrive Chapel. Kind of in light of that video there, Pastor Nate will be taking applications in advance for his daughter who was reading the scriptures there with his wife. So if you'd like to submit, you've got to be in that age of like five to seven years old right now as a young gentleman, but if you'd like to submit an application, we'll be taking those here shortly. I love that part of that video. It just crushes my heart every time for the purity of that. She's sitting up all straight and reading back the Word of God to her mother so eloquently. So welcome today. We're glad you're here at Thrive Chapel, whether you're in person, viewing online. Uh, we're just, in, we're just in, encouraged to be able to be a part of the church, even amidst all these difficult times with everything COVID and everything with our cultures. We continue to navigate this season together. We're continuing to make adjustments ourselves. It's one of the reasons we brought tables and chairs into the auditorium. And as we keep seeing numbers, hopefully continue to, to track it down. We'll return back to Rose here shortly enough. It looks like the curve is kind of settling back in a little bit again <laughs> for the time being anyway. So we'll continue to walk through that with you, and we're excited for that. Um, last week, we started this series um, on John, and it was such an incredible response because inside of, inside of what I talked about last week, um, I referenced the fact that we're in this pursuit of our new building, that our lease is coming to a close, and for so long, there hasn't been much to update, and it, which has frustrated me, and it's probably even retreated me back into a corner because I want to be able to bring some solutions and some, and some line of sight as to where we're going and what it's going to be looking like. And we've just had a lot of no's in this time frame. The, the, the market is uber competitive right now. Um, there's just a lot of other uh, uh, places that landlords and buildings that are for sale can go in the direction of, and a lot of times it's more work to try to engage with the church, so we've gotten a lot of like kind of uh, reverse, I guess, not prejudice, but a reverse like, you know, just, no, nah, no, we don't want to deal with the church, you know, <laughs> so anyway, um, we've got all kinds of different reasons, so this past week or so, we really started to, um, to engage things on a different level with our prayer team, and I invited our prayer team to start prayer walking some things, and start believing that God would kind of step us out of all the natural preparations that we're still working through and trying to find solutions to, but to really bring spiritual solutions in this time as our margin of time begins to, to get down to a, to a, to a deadline. So, um, so we are, we're, we're excited for that. I'm going to continue to give you updates even as they're not real great. Like, for example, I walked through a building across the street on Thursday and the owner looked at me and he goes, you know, <laughs> I really don't want you to do this building, what you're talking about doing. <laughs> and I'm like, man, what's up? So I'm trying to explain to him how, you know, how we developed the space and put an auditorium there. He goes, well, I mean, I, I really don't want to do that because when you leave, I got to tear these walls out, but maybe if it'll help me get to heaven. And I was like, man, that, this don't work that way. I, I'll be glad to talk to you about heaven. But letting us into your space does not help you, okay? Like, uh, uh, we'll talk about that regardless of whether or not we sign a contract. But it's been that kind of conversation, right? Like, it's a warehouse space. He doesn't want us to put walls up because he'd have to tear the walls back down to release it as warehouse space. And that's been kind of the, 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 the opportunities we've been faced with so far. Just, you know, I can go in a different direction, Sean, and not have to do anything here and make, make money a lot easier than what you're talking about uh, paying us for this building. So anyway, praying for us, praying that a natural door continues to be unveiled. Amen. All right, so back to John here. I really wanted to, to look at John this month as the, the faith-filled and faith-strengthening letters that John wrote for us. Uh, we talked last week about how John was the one disciple that lived into his natural death. He lived uh, into, his, into his 90s and mid-90s. Mid uh, he wrote five different books of the Bible, John 1, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, the Gospel of John, and the book of Revelation. And uh, wrote all five of those books in the last 10 years of his life. So it was an incredible uh, pursuit he had for about 80 plus years to then spend the last 10 years really writing these things here uh, for us to, 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 to learn about and to know more about Christ. Uh, he lived 60 years after Jesus' crucifixion, and he was the only disciple to die of natural causes. So John's words just kind of stick a little bit more, for me anyway, and I hope that, um, that they'll stick a little bit for you. So one of the things that we introduced last week that I want to re-go over this week is, is kind of the book ends of life that John helps to highlight through his five books. He starts off by reading in John 1.1, which many of our participants in that video of church members in our church read, that in the, in the beginning was the Word. And what's interesting about this passage for me is that John lived thousands of years after the beginning began. So how does John, how can he see this beginning and say so confidently that the beginning was the Bible? because he has this trust in what he wasn't a part of that has existed in his life today. So he's got a, a difficult perspective that we need to learn how to grab hold of as well. Then he goes to the end of the story in Revelation chapter 4, 
and he, and he sees this vantage point into heaven that Jesus welcomes him into. And he says, I'm going to show you, John, what must take place after this life on earth. Let me show you what this is going to look like once you pass in this natural life and enter into the eternity of heaven. So here's where we find ourselves, right? In between a beginning we have not seen and an ending that we haven't experienced yet, how do we live out this space in the middle? Well, there's where John says in chapter 14 that this word, this Bible became flesh in the form of Jesus. He dwelt or he walked among us, and you and I have the opportunity to behold that glory which is how we stitch together the thing that we haven't seen and haven't experienced yet. So the turbulence of life in the middle gets lived out when we realize His Word is alive and we hold it with our lives. Someone say amen. The problem is that we forget where we came from, and when we forget where we came from, we also lose sight of where we're going. And that's where in the middle of the statement here, we need to get back to the place of reading His Word and beholding His glory in our life through prayer and worship and fellowship so that we can be reminded of where we came from in the beginning, so to know that where we're going is a place of heaven if we'll behold His glory here in the middle. Someone say amen to that. So we're going to uh, begin next Sunday night, have some nights of prayer. We're going to try this for the month of September. I do realize September 19th in a week is the beginning of fall break where a lot of us are, are taking off for uh, vacation or whatever. So if you're gone, uh, no worries. But if you're going to be in town next Sunday... We're going to have a night of prayer and some acoustic worship right here in the auditorium from 6 to 7 p.m. Hope you'll join us and, uh, and check that out. But we just want to stir the embers of prayer right now in this season as a church and in our own faith journey, considering all the things that are happening even outside the four walls of our church. Amen? And then another thing that um, I really want to point you towards, if you haven't gotten it yet, is uh, these, uh, the display for the John series is in the lobby, and it's got these step guides. Uh, it's it's the, the daily reading plan that we have um, uh, for the church. It's something we do every month, and we kind of lay out verses that will go along with the passages. But even more specifically this month, I'm going to be speaking from the previous week's passages. So if you were reading this past week in 2 John, 3 John, and John chapters 1 through 4, that's what I'm going to speak out of this week. And I won't tell you what next week is. You've got to go with the, the bookmark for yourself. And that's what I'll be speaking on next Sunday, all right? So we'll have some fun with that. So as I was reading through... Uh, 2 John, 3 John, and John's chapter 1 through 4. Here's some passages that stuck out to me. In 2 John chapter 1, verse 3, it talks about this grace and this mercy and this peace. Like I'm, These are things I'm looking for right now because my life feels so upended and unsure as to what's coming next. So God, I need your grace to provide it. I need your mercy on me when I try to control it for myself. And please bring peace to my heart. So this grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father will be with us in and... Now, there's this two-edged sword that Scripture often, often refers to itself as, that there is, there's this rightly dividing sense of truth and love. There's truth that brings us back to what the Scripture says, and there's love that captures us how we are and then brings us to the place that He would like to see in us. We don't start in truth. We start in a place of having to get His love to realize we were never good enough anyway, but it's His love that makes us righteous, righteous enough to walk with His truth and to understand it more. And that's something that I think for so many of us, it's, it's available to us, but even though we're in a place where we need truth, oftentimes we love other things more and it keeps us from beginning this equation of realizing His love for us is greater than any love we could ever have in this life for the boats or the football games or, or whatever our, our hobbies and interests are. And if we can get past the loves we've got in this world with the love He has for us, then we can experience His truth. And I think for so many of us, we, we find this dead-end place of life, we find this place of the road of our journey with God that runs out of steam and out of gas because we think, oh my gosh, where has he gone? Like we've gotten to this point, has he just left us here? And a phrase that fell out of last week's service that I've heard people use all week is that God hasn't taken us this far just to leave us where we are. God hasn't taken you this far in your marriage or your career or your health or your finances, and you may not be where you want to be yet, but he hasn't taken you this far to say, ha, you just stay right there forever after even if where you're at has an expiration date on it, he hasn't taken you this far to leave you where you are. So Thrive Chapel exists to help you grow in your next step. And what I all, always hope to be able to do is introduce a, an, an invitation for you to take that next step with us today. So what I want to point your attention towards is the Word of God and a, a, a simple scripture reading plan. The Word, it gives our faith strength to believe the things we have not seen and to trust the things we have not experienced are still coming our way. 
that if you'll trust the Word, it'll give you the faith strength to believe the things you have not seen and have not experienced yet. So I'm actually calling this message Faith Strength, and I'm kind of pulling on the whole idea of live strong or after the, the Boston Marathon bombings, Boston Strong, or you see different um, patients who are going through physical hardships, and they'll put their name, you know, Sean Strong or John Strong or Samantha Strong or whatever, and, and there's this idea of, hey, we've got to have our strength. Well, before you can put your name here or a city's name here or some kind of purpose's name here, you've got to trust that the, the main thing we've got to focus on first is having our faith to be a place of strength. And if we can focus our faith in a place of strength, then we can live beyond any kind of live strong, Boston strong, or patient strong strength that we need because we know in faith that he will bring all things to pass. Someone say amen. So I, I want to share with you kind of a place where my faith was challenged about a month ago. I was introduced to a, a pastoral friend through a mutual friend here, and um, it's a gentleman who used to be in ministry and now just kind of encourages pastors, and his name is Terry, and I was talking with Terry about my life and, you know, just where we're at as a church and, and you know, marriage and family and, you know, all the stories, and kind of got to the point to where he, he kind of latched on to this idea that, well, Sean, it sounds like there's some, there's some inner turmoil with you guys and how you're, you're in the last five months of your church lease and you're, you're looking at a very competitive Atlanta real estate market and you can't find any breakthroughs and the, the pressure starting to build. And is that, is that kind of true? And I was like, well, yeah, 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 that, that, that's true. So he points me to this verse a month ago that became part of our reading plan three weeks ago. Because you, again, you go back to the step guide. It's just funny how God unites all these things. And he shares this verse in John, 1 John chapter 4 with me. And he says... 1 John chapter 4, there we go, 1 John chapter 4, but drives out. Now, it's interesting, I've heard this passage my whole life, and when he read it, I was like, yeah, 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 Terry, get on to the point, like, I don't fear anything. And he looks at me, and he goes, now, Sean, I perceive you're the kind of guy that doesn't fear much. I was like, oh, yeah, <laughs> me, 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 no fear. <laughs> okay, it was funny to me, and maybe it wasn't to you, but anyway, <laughs> maybe you're thinking, that poor sap, oh, my gosh, he should fear something. So I don't, I don't have fear. He's like, you probably don't fear snakes or, you know, if you're the, 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 the boogeyman or, or even people at times. Like, you, you feel like you've got the wherewithal to kind of make it through. Like, you don't wait for the play to come to you. You bring the play to the field. I was like, yeah, yeah, that, that is me. I don't fear. But then he really challenged me with, well, if, if you're trying to resist this, do you really engage that? So, Sean, just for a moment, let's remove the word fear out of this passage and put in there loss of control. So do you exhibit perfect love when you fear or get anxious about losing control of something? And he paints the picture of, you thought a year ago the real estate market might look different than it does right now. Nobody could have imagined the way it looked. And what you had plans for a year ago for your church to walk into this time of year hasn't quite been the case. The ownership of this building changed three years ago. And five years ago, I had a great plan with that owner. Well, the plans changed. And I don't have quite the same control with this new landlord now. And some fear has set me, although I don't want to admit it's fear because I've lost control. And because I've lost control of something, I'm not in perfect love with all the things that overlap there. As I was explaining to him this place of life, I was like, man, I feel like I can't see as clearly right now. I feel like my vision and my anticipation for what's coming next. I'm usually so good at that. And I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm a step behind right now. And it's affected my disposition. And there's a lot of things that have happened this last year and a half, but I feel like I'm kind of stuck in mud, and I don't have the, the fervency and the excitement to move forward. So after this engagement with, with, with Terry, I went back and looked at this, this passage's um, uh, uh, commentary, and it talked about when we fall into the aspect of fear, or as he pointed out for me, a loss of control, we don't have perfect love, and without perfect love, it's as if we're in a place of darkness, because what fellowship does light have with darkness? So you're in either one or the other. So I don't fear, but I don't have perfect love. So if I don't have perfect love, that means I'm in a place that's being described as darkness. And in darkness, you don't have vision. You can't see. So I had to go back and rectify something in my heart this past week that brought light back to a particular area of my heart that lost perfect love towards a situation and towards a person. And I had to shake some fear and some loss of control out and say, God, you are in control. Let me shine light back here. So John is just picking at this wound for us throughout his, 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 his letters and his teachings. And that's where I want to focus our attention today and probably where the next couple of messages will go. So if you will, just kind of carry along with me here. I want you to imagine your own faith journey right now and how God wants to challenge your faith 
to strengthen it in only the way he says you can. Do not rely on yourself or a favorite friend who encourages you or whatever habit we have that helps to settle or even numb the certain pains we have in this life, but allowing the word to speak strength to the lack of faith that we have. If you've got your note sheet or if you track along with us in the digital version of the YouVersion Bible app, we'd love for you to take some notes and take some, some thoughts and scriptures down of, of, of what we'll talk about today and carry that into your week. If you're new with us today, we challenge all of our guests to take the three-visit challenge, check Thrive Out three times, see if we're the church for you. This is also a great invitation guide for you to use as you're inviting people. Hey, look, just come three times. If you don't like it, you never have to come back a fourth time. People love that idea that there's light at the end of the tunnel. I don't have to show up one time, and you're going to bring cookies to my house every Monday morning to say, you need to come back next week? So three-visit challenge. Check us out. You can record that visit there on the Connect card. If you turn that Connect card in and you're a guest, not if you're a regular, but if you're a guest, the, the welcome team at the Welcome Center there will give you a gift card to either uh, Chick-fil-A or Starbucks. So that's worth probably the ink time it takes to write out that connection card or fill it out digitally. So um, I'm going to look today with you at John's letter of faith. John had these letters uh, th throughout the first, second, and third John where he's encouraging leaders of another church, churches that he helped to start, churches that his, uh, that his ministry passed through. And it's, it's these handwritten notes, essentially, where he's really trying to encourage those he had fellowship with amidst the difficulty they're facing. So picking up here in the third book of John, chapter 1, verse 2, he writes off, Dear friend, I hope all is well with you, that you are as healthy in body. I'm going to come back to this. As healthy in body as you are, as you are strong in spirit. Now, again, it's, it's strength for faith. It's faith strong and not Boston strong or Jimmy strong. It's, it's how do we find ourselves strong in spirit. I think all of us give a lot of attention to how to be healthy. We may not be very good at doing it, but we give a lot of attention to we want to have a diet, we have a certain weight that we want to be at, and we have a, you know, a certain regimen we want to try to be on, and how many times we want to exercise, and what the exercise looks like. So we, we have these goals here. Do you have as many goals for this as you do for this? Are you thinking about your diet and how well you eat the Word and put yourself in front of the Word? Are you looking at how you can edify yourself in places of weakness to build your life up in the spirit like you do in your body? Do you have a plan of getting to the spiritual gym three times, five times each, you know, a, a per week or each day? Are you making a plan like you have for your body like you do for the spirit? We keep reading here in verse number five. He then, John writes to the church, you are, you're, you're faithful. So you got this routine. You, you keep doing it. Even when you fall short and you plan, kind of put one priority over another, you're faithful in what you're doing for the brothers and sisters, even though they're strangers to you. In other words, we as a church can't become so comfortable with who we are that we're not looking to become or discomfortable with somebody else. And a church, not the church, but a church like Thrive Chapel can fall into a victim of hey, you know what, like it's kind of it's convenient for me right now to experience my God and my church this way. I don't think I want to invite my boss here because they might get a different viewpoint of me. And all of a sudden, I, I may not be able to tell the same jokes or use the same curse words at the office because now my spiritual life has been exposed to my boss. So I'm just not going to invite my boss to church. That's the work world. This is my faith world. And the longer we have these circles that we're unwilling to overlap and try to keep people at strangers Paul's saying we're not being faithful to what he's called us to. So verse 8 goes a little further, and he says, uh, we therefore ought to receive such, and this is me adding a word here because John just said receive such, and I want you to focus on the fact that it is people is our, our main spiritual duty to become strong in spirit. We ought to receive such people that they may become fellow workers for the truth. In other words, what happens when our lives in different circles overlap, there's moments of not untruth and not truth in their life and in our life that now has to intersect. We have to receive God's love in that aspect, like we shared earlier, so that we can find truth. And sometimes when we're not willing to overlap those circles, we have this thought or this idea or this preference to keep things separate. And that's never what John had, had desired for us. It was unity in the kingdom by laying our life down to resemble more of the word that we're reading so we can share it with others to do the same. Someone say amen. So we jump out of the third book of John here, and we get into uh, the gospel of John. In John chapter 1, 
And I love here this, this ramp that we'll use to get into a story in John chapter 4 where it says here in, in chapter 1 that God created everything through Jesus and nothing was created except through Him. That the, the Word gave the life you're seeking for, the answer, the hope, the prayer you're desiring, the Word gave that life to everything that was created. And then because the Word gave life, Jesus' life brought light. So the place, like I explained for me, where we fall into fear or loss of control or whatever you want to call that opposite of perfect love, when we fall into that, that space of worrying or having concern, then we have a, a cloud of darkness that surrounds us. But if we'll read His Word, like the Word was presented to me, and then I took a, a further jump into the commentary to figure out what that Word was that was supposed to give me life, then I realized this light of Jesus that enlightened an area of darkness in my heart. That's the whole goal that we have here, that in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. So if I'll dive into the Word, it's like He's sitting, dwelling beside me, and I can behold the glory that He always intended for my life. It's as simple as having a schedule to open your Bible and read it, just like you and I have three hot meals a day, well, maybe four and sometimes five. But anyway, again, are we putting as much attention to our spirit being strong as we are our body. Strong in spirit, uh, uh, John said, become faithful. Receive people that are not like you to then find unity in the word and the truth that is the word because that word gives life and the life leads to a light that illuminates part of your life that cannot come any other way. So as I found that I was weak in an area, I decided to become faithful and receive this new name, this name that we just sang about here at the end of worship today. And from there, you have a new perspective. Areas that have been pulled back in your life now get accelerated because of what God wants to do in you and through you. So I want to read a, a passage here in John chapter 4 where it talks about the Samaritan woman at the well. And I read this passage a little bit differently to, uh, this week because I've always heard of and focused on the primary message in this passage about how Jesus was confronting a woman about her adultery. And not to get into all the details of that, but here's this woman who had several husbands and is sleeping with another guy that's not her husband currently, and blah, 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 blah. So that's the main focus that rolls out of this passage. And there's a secondary focus that depicts the fact that she's a Samaritan and Jesus is a Jew. And Samaritans and Jews did not cross. It's, it's a perfect picture of some of the racial tensions we have in our country and world today. These are people that did not connect together. That's usually the second focus that rolls out of that. I want you and I to look at the prayer focus and the faith-strengthening focus that came out of this that ultimately leads to freedom when we realize the name of who's speaking to us. So in John chapter 4, verse 5 and 6, so speaking of Jesus, he came to a town in Samaria called, yeah, exactly, I didn't know what it was either, so I just wanted you to try to say it so I could, <laughs> I set you up there. It's, it's Shakar, Shakar, something like that. So anyway, uh, he came to this place called Shakar. It's near a plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son, Joseph. And then Jacob's well was also there. And Jesus, tired as he was from the journey with the disciples, he then sat down by this well. And it was about noon, so you can imagine it was, it was high, hot time. Sun was just beaten down. And what's interesting about this place is Shakar used to be called Shechem, Shechem was a place that Abram had been called from his land to go and discover that God said, Abram, I'm calling you out of your land to come to a new land, to a new place, to find a new blessing for my people that I'll bring through you. But you don't know where you're going yet. And boy, that encouraged me because guess where I feel right now? I don't know where we're going. And it's really frustrating. But there's this deep history because not only does Abram find this place called Shechem that becomes a place that that, that, uh, that Jacob buys ground, gives it to his son Joseph, that Jacob digs a well. There's this great historic symbolism here. And here we find the, the layers continuing Jesus in the downline of Abraham's family tree. Now he's here waiting for a drink of water. So if you're taking notes, the first thing we've got to understand to make our faith strong is sometimes unknown history, things we're unaware of, right? I see it up there, but I don't see it here. Right there, back here, no? Something wrong? Something's wrong, okay. All right, so number one is unknown history is available for faith strength. 
Y'all try to fix that. Let me know when you got it fixed, all right? <laughs> so what happens from this passage right here is this, all this history, this rich history, that if you're not careful, there is this bed of fertile soil available to you that you don't even know the strength that could be there. So at this well where Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob all pass through, this well that's built for, 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 for Jacob, this, this land that's given to Joseph, this place that, that Jesus so happens to step into now has a, a, a birthing place for this experience with the woman at the well. So in John chapter 4, verse 7, are we back? There we go. Hey, look at that. Let me give the text a big hand clap. There we go. Tech, I heard a great phrase this week, technology. There's nothing more frustrating than when technology doesn't work except when technology almost works. Okay, like there, uh, I, that, that just perfectly summarizes technology. It's, it's awful. But when it doesn't work for no good reason, you're like, ah, whatever, it stinks. But it's like, it should work right here. What's not happening? So here we are. Okay, we're working now. So John chapter 4, verse 7, in, the, in the, 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 the shadow there of unknown history helps you build faith strength. When the Samaritan woman, a different racial ethnic group from Jesus, when she came to draw water from the well, Jesus asks her, what is Jesus doing talking to her? What is she doing listening to a man of Jesus' descent? Will you give me a drink of water? Now, Hebrews talks about how you and I can unknowingly entertain angels, that, that we might be talking to somebody at Walmart, and unbeknownst to us, God has placed a person or a presence in front of us that might change some kind of thing that we're facing and experiencing. Here's a moment for the Samaritan woman. If she can get past what she sees and focus on the name of the person she's talking to, her life might change. So secondly today, if you're taking notes, sometimes we have to have a willing belief in order to build faith strength. It's not a wristband you put on, because sometimes you've got to trust that in the beginning was the word. I wasn't there, so how can I believe that's the case? Well, I've got to willingly believe that this word is truth for my life, and I'm going to look for love to catch me where I am so that that love of God can bring me to where I need to be. God is trying to, to speak to, to, to uh, the woman here, and, and she doesn't know his name. She's not asking his name. She goes through all the things that we didn't experience in that last worship song we just sang there. So she's a Samaritan woman, Jesus is a Jew, it's not her kind of people, so she immediately puts up this front, then a verse we're not going to read, she kind of says, what should I have to do with you? What I do want to pick up here is in John chapter 4, verse 10, where Jesus asks the Samaritan woman, if you, if you knew what was standing before you, lady, if you would ask and seek to understand before being understood, and not look first to our divide, but ask why there should be unity, if you could look past the fact that we have differences and, and how us strangers, as, as John wrote, if we'll just be faithful, we can see the unity and, 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 and Scripture grow in our life. If you just knew the gift of God of who it is, the name of, of the person that's asking you for a drink, you would have asked this name, capital H, him, and he would have given you living water. You see, you even forgot to ask the right question because you forgot to ask the name of the one you're talking to. And a lot of times we run into that issue because if you only knew, if you only took time to willingly believe and trust in what you have not seen or have not experienced, and in the middle, if you'll just behold his glory, there could be something there for you of unknown history because of your willing belief in the moment. And thirdly, where Jesus and this woman had to step into was an awkward unity that ultimately delivers faith strength. Now, let me explain this for a second. What does awkward unity mean? It's stepping into something you don't know, completely have trust or experience in, and you're not sure how it's going to turn out. So John says, in the beginning was the Word, and at the end, Jesus says, come on up here, and I'll show you how things are going to turn out in the end. And somewhere in the middle, we've got to behold His glory because His Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And awkward unity is, I'm going to take this thing I have not seen, I'm going to trust something I haven't experienced yet, and I'm going to walk through this like I have this connection to this paper Bible as if it's a person speaking to me in the form of Jesus. That feels awkward. But if you'll trust the awkwardness and how that can bring some unity, you can build your faith strength. So I asked our prayer team this week to, to take the, the awkward steps of taking this prayer walk with me. And some things that we're kind of presenting to the Lord and asking for the Lord to, to bring His will and make it so clear to everyone involved that we would have 
vision and, and a disposition that was clear going forward. That's a it's an awkward unity. But John chapter 4, verse 19 and 20, it gets to kind of the conclusion of the story here, and you see the awkwardness trying to keep from unity. The woman said back to Jesus, Sir, I love that, like, still not even using his name, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Now, I got to admit here, a little telling of myself, I always read this passage in the voice of Yoda. Sir, mm, prophet, I perceive you are. Mm. I, just, I just, for some reason, like, I just, I, okay, anyway. Um, so I perceive you're a prophet. Obviously, you're telling me something that I have not told you. She's not connecting with his name yet, trying to keep it informal. She tells him, listen, our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they worshiped on this mountain. And what she's referencing here is a mountain that Abram, Abraham was called to sacrifice his son, Isaac. Not getting into all that story, but they built a temple there, the Samaritan people, and they worshiped at this place because that was the last faith highlight that they set their mind and attention around. They didn't continue to follow the story of God from that experience. But you say, Jesus, that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship because Jesus brought a new way. I have not come to abolish the old way. Yes, this significance still happened on the mountain, but I now want you to follow me in the spirit. I'll leave in this, in this midst for you. Here's where I want you to go. That probably feels awkward, but I want you to step into that unity to trust and believe that God wants to build your strength. And that's the faith journey that John leads us through. It ain't easy. Otherwise, you would have already done it to complete perfection. I would have not have had to have the conversation with Terry a month ago, and probably next week, and again a month and a year after that. <laughs> we are incomplete projects. My hope is through this series that we'll continue to pull those layers back of the onion and kind of look deeper into the subject. But the reality is this is an ongoing process for us all. In fact, in a moment, I want to kind of focus our attention towards what Jesus told her after here, because I'm kind of leaving you hanging. Like, what's, what's the antidote, right? She's, like, she's pitching a question to him. I'm going to wait to answer that just for a moment. But let's focus our heart on where the prayer and the focus of the rest of our day, hopefully week in life, goes from here. So I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes just for a moment. And Father, I thank you for this opportunity and this time to come into your house, into your place of worship, and invite your presence to exist inside of us in a way or in a fashion that we have not allowed you to this point. God, help us to continue to walk out our faith to become stronger in you. And Jesus, if some of us sit here today and we feel weakened or held back or in some way unwilling to take some steps that have been made an example for us in Scripture, I pray that you help to enliven us today, to give us clearer vision and a greater disposition to walk forward the things that you've called us to. In Jesus' name, we all said, amen. I'm going to read this last passage to you, then we're going to close with a worship song. Um, listen, if, if, you, um, if you listen to that prayer and there's something that we can help you with, obviously that connect card is the simplest way to communicate that to us and with us. We'd love to engage with you in whatever faith step you might be facing, whether it's a place of united with you in prayer for a hope of something or united with you in a, a strategy to get through something you're facing. We want to connect with you in that. Let me turn you here to John chapter 4, verse 23. Here's kind of the, the walkaway point. Jesus leaves a Samaritan woman at the historic place of Jacob's well with. So she's, she's looking at the difference between Samaritans and Jews. He comes back to her and he says, listen, there is a time that's coming. A time that, indeed, it's here now. So let's not wait until all the story is unfolded. Let's not wait until the play comes to us. Let's not try to step too far into the future and try to control something for ourselves. But the time is here now to do what? When true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, the Father is looking for those who will worship Him that way. That's what we're going to do this morning. I'm going to invite you to stand to your feet. Once you get to your feet, if you would close your eyes and bow your head right where you're at. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come into your presence again. God, to sing of all the things you have for us and to lead us to a place that you have next. God, regardless of what we have not been aware of or made aware of in our past, of your past, of your great history, God, no matter how the end of the story comes and how we may not be able to control or influence that difference, God, we pray in the here and now 
that we can watch your presence through your word dwell amidst our presence to walk along with us so we can behold the glory that you've set before us. God, for all the answers we don't have, for all the solutions we're not sure of, for all the directions we're still waiting to have you materialize for us, we want to raise our voice in support of your spirit driving us forward. As we sing this song, God, we're going to sing it in the midst of difficulty and obstructions and hindrances and storms. But God, we know as we voice this praise that you bring us the solution we cannot find any other way. In Jesus' name, we all said...